work it, make it, do it, makes us. What does reactive actually mean? My name is Clément Escoffier. I'm working for Red Hat as a Vertex core developer. And even if I'm going to use Vertex for all the demos and all the things I'm going to present and explain why Vertex makes sense for the reactive world, the main interest for you in this session is to just understand what does reactive mean. So are we fashionista, yes or no? Because every single week when I check my Twitter feed, I found another reactive thing. Reactive system, reactive manifesto, reactive extension, reactive programming, reactive spring, reactive streams, and so on. We have many, many, many new reactive things that arrive every single week. Does all those reactive mean the same thing? Or are they different? And actually, just to make everybody really, really confused, we associate reactive with scalability, non-blocking I.O., event loop, asynchronous, back pressure, agent, actors, spreadsheets, yes, spreadsheets, and so on. So it's all this world is really, really starting to be confusing. So when I joined uh, the Vertex team a couple of years ago, I say, well, let's do some reactive stuff that looks cool, but I was coming from a very, very different background. I was doing dynamic and modular system. Actually, modular system seems to be trendy uh, since last week, but yes. Um, I was doing that before, so I'm, I'm an old school guy. I did something that no one is doing anymore. It's opening a dictionary to the reactive world, and I read, reactive means showing a response to a stimulus. Okay, fine, that looks good. But it, it has a second definition, which is actually very interesting, is acting in response to a situation rather than creating and controlling it. Okay, but what does that mean for my software? So when we apply this definition to software, well, we can say that a reactive software is just a software that is going to show responses to stimuli. That looks cool, looks simple, looks vague enough. I can probably work with that. But what are those stimuli? It can be almost anything. And that's actually what, why we have so many reactive things that we don't have the same type of stimuli everywhere. It can be events, it can be message, it can be requests, it can be failures, it can be the availability of your services or devices or your power lever, uh, your battery lever on a mobile phone, or if you are doing roaming and so on, your network connectivity, all this stuff are stimuli, but you don't control them. You don't control anything here. Your system, your code, is not going to follow what you have said when you developed it, but what the, all the stimuli are telling you to do. So before, you were writing line one, line two, line three, and everything was fine. We were controlling the flow of your system. With this, you are going to do this, but what will be next does not depend on you. It depends on the other stimuli that may arrive at the same time. And things start to be kind of interesting there. There is one type of stimuli that I didn't mention yet. Something that we don't do anymore, it's a keystroke. You know, I push the button here, A, and I expect to have an A somewhere on my screen. We do that all day long. So there is something somewhere that react to this event and do something and print it on my screen. And according to the definition, this is also reactive. So is it new? No. And actually, reactive come from the 70s, even probably before the 70s. So that's actually not really new. So the reactive landscape is kind of fragmented with all those reactive things. And in this uh, uh, session, we're going to see three different class of reactive, which are mainly the three main class of reactive that we have today. On one side, we have reactive systems. Reactive systems are far from being new. It's come from actor systems, so 70s, then it have all those agent system, and more recently, also autonomic systems, self-adaptive system, and so on. So reactive systems are an architectural style to build better distributed system, responsive distributed system. On the other side, I have reactive programming. This one is about architecture. This one is about programming. 
and reactive programming just an API that will let you write code around data flow and very close to functional programming. What's interesting is to see that if we take the Java world, here we have two technologies, Akka, which is a pure actor model, and Vertex. And on the other side, we have Reactor from Pivotal, we have Reactive Extension, which is initially was an initiative from Microsoft, and now it's so popular that we have binding in all language. And we have Vertex too. Hmm, Vertex is on both sides. Let's add the third part, the third class of Reactive Things. Reactive Streams. Reactive Streams is actually just an API, it's four classes, really four interface, that just lets you implement back pressure in your program. We are going to see that, don't worry. And here, in terms of implementation of reactive streams, we have Aka Stream, Reactive Extension V2, the V1 does not, Reactor, Vertex 2, and so on. And Reactive Stream is actually coming inside Java 9 under the name of Flow. Because, yes, that's always good to change name when people start being used with one. So they change name, cool. Um, so let's have a look to all those reactive things and see how they relate to each other. Ten years ago, ten years ago, everything was fine. It was a good old time. I was doing very, very bad HTML1 UI with forms, with buttons where you just write things in a database and was deploying a T-ball, really using T-ball, not div with fancy things, really a T-ball. And everybody was happy. That was my application. That was very simple to write this. And time flies. First, the application start to be a bit more complicated, and they say, yeah, let's get some of those features out of it. Like the pricing system need to be done by another team, so let's do that. So that's what we see in microservices. Can be non-functional, like all the authentication and security can be delegated to another system too. Don't do security by yourself. There is people where it's a passion to do that. Yeah, they don't have a life, but why, why not? Um, then, obviously, if you do that, you can be used by software. Cool, so software is going to be used, so you need to provide an API for that, probably REST kind of thing. Genoa is just an HTTP API, but yeah, okay, why not? That shouldn't be fine. You can do that. Ah, users. Ah, come on, users. Users always want the, the, the thing up to date, always. They don't want to refresh a page, they want to have the change on their browser, on their phone, immediately, as soon as it's there. So we need to think about, hey, how do I push things to my users? And something that is interesting, software never sleep, users do, but with this, they don't sleep anymore. So they're always there, you still need to push them data every time. Ah, the IoT too, ah, the IoT is cool because IoT, like software, n really, really never sleep. It's just a big amount of data that will be sent to your application. I say IoT, but it can be anything where you will consume events. So we have a lot of events, and you need to handle this somehow, some way. And as everything is such a mess, you decide to do distributed tracing, distributed logging, or, another, or anything. So adding another data store where you will do stuff inside to try to understand why your system is so slow and so on. So why it's so complicated? Because all those interactions cross the process boundary. All of them are distributed interactions. You are inside your browser, you can use an app server. It's still distributed. It uses HTTP in between. And so on. So you need, we need to be aware that it is distributed. And as it's distributed, it's going to fail. That's all. That's the first rule of distributed computing. It fails. Why first, all of this, you can't predict the load that you are going to have. You don't know. So you, maybe your application is going to be very, very popular. We hope so. And then you will need to think about all your architecture, your application, to be able to, to handle all this load. And everything you use may be slow, fail, unavailable, under update, or just incompatible with the previous version. Ah, compatibility and versioning. So you will need to be able to handle failures, to handle timeouts, or whatever. If we do timeouts and retry, can I really retry? Is there 
that there is many, many questions you need to, uh, to ask yourself before doing such kind of system. That was so simple at the beginning. So let's see the first type of reactive things that we are going to see, reactive systems. So reactive systems, it's an architectural style to build such kind of systems in a reliable and responsive way. It has been defined by the Reactive Manifesto. You can read it. It's a uh, two or three page. It's very easy to read. And it focuses on responsiveness. One main thing, it's asynchronous message uh, passing. And that's the important part of the Reactive Manifesto. All your components are going to discuss using messages. When you send a message, you send a message to a virtual address. I don't send a message to you in particular. I send a message to here, and maybe some of you are going to pick it. I don't care. The system is going to dispatch the message. So OK, I send a message. The advantage of this is that I have a complete decoupling between my two components. So that's pretty cool. When sending the message, I'm non-blocking here. I'm really doing asynchronous message passing. So I can still handle the load and send other message. I'm not waiting for a response, at least not actively. If there is a response, I will receive it using another message like this. So when you have this in place, it's easy to be elastic. Why? Because, well, as I say, if I have too many messages, I don't care. I'll just create another consumer listening to the same virtual address, and the system will dispatch it, probably using a round robin or something a bit more clever, hopefully. But yeah, it will just dispatch. I don't care. Failures. And resilience. Resilience is not about managing failures or exception or a try catch. No. Resilience is about being able to recover after this. It's about self healing. So if this component fails, the message won't be processed. So the system can quickly decide if you need to remit it or delegate to this component to say, oh, sorry, I was not able to process it, do something else. But during that time, as it's all asynchronous, I can still handle the load and send those messages, and everything is fine. My system does not suffer from a failure from somewhere else. So if you have this, you are going to be asynchronous. You are going to be resilient. You are going to be elastic. So yes, you are going to be bulletproof and be able to respond to your request in an acceptable amount of time every time. And that's pretty cool. That's what we want to do. So finally, it's, it's actually very simple, right? My system that was a big mess, I just say, yeah, let's just send message all over the place, and everything is fine, and everything is going to work. Everything is going to work, except that the guy that is going to code the application is going to die pretty quickly. Why? Because, well, all those messages are going to happen at the same time. So if you use a thread-based system, it's going to be very, very complicated. You may have lots of threads, and threads means deadlock, always. So you can't try, don't do thread. If you are, uh, don't do thread. That's the rule. It's also going to be asynchronous. And we're going to see that. There is a nice thing about asynchronous is that you never know what is going to happen in your system. It's almost unpredictable. And that's pretty cool, but pretty dangerous at the same time. So when you want to develop a reactive systems, you need to be very pragmatic about how you do that. First thing, you need to embrace asynchronous all the way down. Don't think in terms of synchronous. Think about terms of asynchronous. That's kind of hard for you. It's actually pretty hard because since the 80s, we lie to us. We lie to us by saying, hey, we don't care. Everything is synchronous in the world. Actually, it's not true. It's the opposite. Nothing is synchronous. There is absolutely nothing that is synchronous in a computer si system. Everything is asynchronous. And we will need to face it, face the reality. That just, OK, it's there. It's asynchronous. We have to embrace it. Don't use thread. You can use task base, event loops, or whatever, but don't use threads. If you use threads, you are going to have a lot of synchronized <laughs> and a lot of deadlocks. And you don't want that. Or you can use this volatile keyword that nobody really understands what it means, so don't, yeah. Or check the spec, but it's very complicated. All your I.O. need to be non-blocking. Never block, especially because you are using an event loop. So if you block, then you cannot continue to execute your system. So you must not block. So everything is going to be non-blocking. 
but some stuff can't. And that's where you need to be pragmatic. I said, don't do thread, except if you have no choice. So, like GDBC. So all of this bring you to the asynchronous non-blocking development model. Asynchronous development. Uh, that exists in the early days of computing, right? The keystroke, that's asynchronous, and it's working. Interruption in your system, signals, everything is asynchronous, and it was existing. And since the 80s, because we think that developers cannot understand asynchronous, we try to make things synchronous. But actually, it's not the case. It's really asynchronous, and we will see that it's not that bad. Kind of, but not too much. So there is different approach for this. The first one is callbacks. We are going to see this one. Futures or promise, that's another way to deal with asynchronous operation. We can s use data flow variable, we can use data streams, or you can use continuation, coroutines, and so on. But let's focus on callback. The idea behind callback is really being in Hollywood. Don't wait, we are going to call you. Or not. Nobody called me back. I don't know. Um, so in the synchronous way, you do this, compute, and you pass the parameters, and at some point there is something that will turn a result. And on the consumer side, you wait until this compute method has returned. So you wait, your thread is blocked. But the next line of that is going to be executed is this one here, the one just after that. So that's good, you are in control, you know exactly what will be next. In an asynchronous world, you pass the parameters and you will pass a callback. Here I use the, uh, the vertex syntax. So the callback is actually not getting the result, but generally an async result. Why? How many exit possibilities do we have here? The result and an exception. So it's actually two. But who check exception? Seriously. If it's a runtime exception, well, it will fail the whole program, but we don't care. Here, we can't do that anymore. So we encapsulate the result inside the structure, which is a sync result, which will tell you whether or not the operation has succeeded or failed. And when you consume it, we'll just pass this uh, lambda or your callback like that. You can use method reference or whatever. So that looks pretty simple like that. So if I try to do an HTTP server in Vertex, I will have, so I create my HTTP server and I register a request handler, and every time that I have a request, I react to this stimulus, stimuli, and I just say, hey, let's print the name of the thread, just to see. Starting an HTTP server takes a lot of time. It's actually very, very blocking and uh, asynchronous because there is a lot of things that happen uh, at the operating system level. So here you say, well, tell me when you're done, and whether or not you have been successful. So if I run this, and just, yep, just run. So you and here we go. Server started. So server started means that a fully successful has been successful. Good. And if I go here, oop, give me this. I have every single invocation, I get the same thread, right? I do refresh here when you see that. And every time I have the same thread. This is the application of the pragmatic reactive, uh, reactive system rules to use an event loop, meaning that my whole system is going to use a single thread. But that's fine. Even this callback and this has been called by the same thread. So the advantage of not using of using a single thread is that you don't need synchronize anymore because you can't be called at the same time. There is a single thread, so you cannot be called at the same time. Okay, callback leads to, well, what we call callback hell. That was very nice with my HTTP server, very, okay, that's my request and those things, but let's imagine that you want to deal with a GDBC database or database. First, you need to get a connection from a connection pool. Okay. This is asynchronous. You get your connection. So you need to check the failures about an old call. We just say, OK, failure ending. Once you have your connection, you will emit your query. OK, fine. I emit my query. This is also asynchronous. So I have a uh, second callback here where 
of course I need to check whether it has failed or not, and then I just get the result and do what I want to do with my result, and when I'm done, I must release the connection, right? So this is also asynchronous. So we have three callbacks, three nested callbacks. Why? Because we just wanted to say, once you have the connection, do that, and when you are done, do that. So when you start using such kind of development style, the first thing you will do is to change the number of space in a tab inside, uh, inside your indentation in your IDE. Seriously, you, we, I'm using two. I'm thinking about using one. If I use zero, that's going to be confusing. But yeah, you, you have no choice. It's really nested things, so you don't want to do that. Anywhere we are going to see the second reactive things, which is reactive programming. Um, I'm doing a lot of, uh, of travel. Oh, before that, do we have people uh, using Excel or Google Spreadsheet or uh, Apple number? We do? So if you don't, look at those people, because those people are the true experts of reactive programming. They don't know it yet, but we are going to explain them. So, as I said, I, I do a lot of travel meetings and so on, and the most painful experience when I do travel is not the jet lag or the food in the plane. Well, it's kind of hopeful, but yeah. It's really my expense report. And when I do my expense report before entering in my lovely <laughs> uh, corporate system, um, I generally use Excel or something like that. And I say, okay, I have lunch, 15 pounds. And I have coffee, I drink a lot of coffee, as you can see, 25 pounds. And drinks, 45 pounds, because in addition to coffee, I'm also drinking a lot of uh, whiskey. Um, and I have this cell here, and actually this cell is actually very interesting because this cell observes the other cell. So for example, in next cell, I would just say, oh, just a sum of those cells, right? We all did that. So there is this idea of observation. This cell is observing the other cell. So let's take a time machine a bit. At the beginning, I wrote 15. Oh, no, it's Doro. Oh, cool. Um, uh, Doro, and then I have 15 uh, uh, US dollar here. And then I write 25, and I have 40. So over time, the value in my cells change. So I have a stream, a sequence of data over time, right? That's relatively simple. So when you are in Excel, you see only the latest value. But behind the scene, you have more than one value. You have all the different revisions of your, of your cell. That's the true nature of reactive programming. Reactive programming is about stream of data called observable in the uh, reactive extension terminology and functions that will we apply on those observable to generate other observable. Let's take an example. I have this sequence of integer over time. First I have one, two, three, four. So time is going this way. The first function I will apply on this is say, okay, take this integer and do a plus one. So when I got that, then when one is emitted, I just return two. When I got two, I just return three. So it's also a stream, because over time, we are emitting new values, right? So we have another stream. The blue stream is a bit more complicated, because I'm going to take those two last value and do a sum. So we have five and nine and so on. If I want to write that using one of the most popular reactive programming API for Java, which is Rx, Rx uh, reactive extension for Java, I will write it like that. My red stream is just all the integer between 1 and 10, or whatever. It can be unbounded. Then I have my green one, which is just observing the first one. And every time that I, there is a new value, I'm just doing plus 1. And as I said, this is a stream. And then I have the blue one. So the blue one is a bit more tricky because it uses the window operator to get the last two value. And then I'm doing a flat map. While map just return one value, one data, flat map can return an observable. So that means potentially a sequence of data. And as there is flat in the name, you can believe that it will and just create a sequence of all those values. Something that is very disturbing the first time you use Eric's <laughs> is this part. Because if you stop here, nothing is going to happen. It's very confusing. You say, what? And actually, you need to subscribe, because by default, you just create the structure, but does not instantiate it. And if you subscribe, 
they need to materialize a pipeline and get things through. We are going to see a couple of examples of this. Um, when you are using reactive programming, so there is Rx1, Rx2, Reactor, you more or less have the same kind of concepts uh, everywhere. You have stream of data that in Rx we call observable, in Rx2 they call observable and fluible, uh, that can be bounded or unbounded stream of value, and inside your observable you can have three things. Data, cool, so the next data, an error, or the signals that tell you, well, I reach the end of the, of the stream, so you won't get any more data. Singles are a specialization of observable where you can have a single value. So in that case, inside your stream, you will have either the result or an error. And completable, which are just single, but there is no value. So you can just say whether it has succeeded or failed. So why it's interesting for handling and taming the asynchronous? Because observable, it's what we call async reaction. You are observing a set of stimuli and you are going to react to that one. And a set of stimuli, it's a stream. Because over time, you have different data that you will receive. Singles are all the asynchronous operation. You create this asynchronous operation, you don't have the result yet, but as soon as you have it, the singles get a value and then you can continue your pipeline and complete it and so on. So if we retake my GDBC example, with this three nested callback and rewrite that with, uh, uh, with Rx, it will be like that. So I use the Vertex GDBC client, I just do get connection on it, that is an asynchronous operation, and it's an asynchronous operation, you return a single. When I get a value, when the connection came in, then I just say, okay, now that I have my connection, I'm going to, so, so using a flat map, I'm using, uh, doing my query. My query, is going to retrieve a stream of row that I have here. So that's going to give my stream of row. And I have this very, very neat uh, things in Eric that say, OK, and when you're done, just close the connection. And I'm done. There I have my observable of rows, so all the rows that I have from my database. And I create my uh, entity or whatever uh, ORM you are using, or just your Pojo. And that's all. So my three nested callback is ju actually just like this. Much more readable, right? At least I can barely understand what's going on here. Ah, uh, but does that work? Actually, yes, it works. But what happens if, let's imagine that we have a really, really fast database, or is something really fast that will, as soon as I emit the query, send all the row in really big batch and I have not have the time to do my <coughs> maps in here. So all will work. So it will buffer, buffer, buffer until, until you don't have memory anymore. So fortunately, in the Vertex world, we, are, uh, that we have back pressure. But yeah, that's what we are going to see right now. What happens when your system cannot keep up with the amount of data it's getting received? So all the stimuli and so on. So let's take this IoT kind of thing. So I have lots of data, and I need to handle that. So for example, I have my source of data that return, well, let's say JSON object. And I want to execute this process in the right order. So concat map instead of flat map, really wait for the uh, previous one to be, comp uh, to be completed before calling to the next one. And this process take a long time to return or to be executed. What we are going to have if we run this, well, with Rx, we are going to have a missing back pressure exception. If you are using another you, that you have made a system, you probably are going to have a buffer ex uh, overflow exception, or worse, a hot of memory exception. So what can we do? First thing, we can just drop. <laughs> right? OK, I have too much stuff. I don't care. Yeah, we all did that with our to-do list, right? As soon as the to-do list starts to be too hard or too big, just pick a couple of items. My manager is here, so I cannot say which one. And just drop them. OK, we can do that. But sometimes we can't really do this. So when we can't do this, we need to find another way. And this other way will be to really implement back pressure. There is many back pressure models. Um, Vertex has a very simple one 
which is pause resume, and Reactive Streams propose another one, which is uh, based on request and subscription. So what is back pressure? It's just an uncheck between the consumer and the source. And instead of letting the source emitting lots of events to my consumer and my consumer can't keep up, well, it will just say, hey, come on, I tell you when you can send me stuff. So we reverse completely the control. We were still speaking about data flow, where the data was coming from the source and we need to process it. And here, because we have back pressure, it's the opposite. The consumer is going to trigger or tell the source that is ready to handle some load. So in a pause resume, uh, uh, like in Vertex, in the Vertex core, it's going to be very simple. We resume and it send data, and as soon as we are full, we say, oh, pause. And if you use reactive streams or flow, then it's almost the same. Uh, your publisher subscribe, no, your subscriber subscribe to the uh, to the publisher, get a subscription object, and on this subscription it will say request, and request will be the number will pass the number of item you can receive uh, from the source. So for example, give me three, boop boop boop, and then give me another three, and get, and so on. What <laughs> generally generally uh, request one and get one, request one and get one, but yeah. Um, just because it's much more simple to, to design like that. Um, but it's very simple, right? There is nothing very complicated behind that. Actually, back pressure is nothing new. If we have internet today, it's because TCP has back pressure built in. When you download a file, there is back pressure and so on. So there is nothing very complicated behind that. But here now, it starts to be very something where we need to be familiar with, especially in the Java world, because we have much more and more data and we need to think about it. Um, so let's talk a bit about Vertex and how it can make your life much more easier when you want to address reactive things. So what is Vertex? So first it's Eclipse Vertex, and it's an Eclipse project. And Vertex is a toolkit to build distributed and reactive systems. It has been designed since the last five years with reactive in mind from the first line of code. Reactive was what we were targeting. It's not something that we have added on top of other systems. No, it's something where it's built from scratch to be reactive. Um, it proposes uh, an asynchronous non-blocking development model. Actually, no. It proposes a set of asynchronous non-blocking development models. You can use callbacks, if you like. Actually, the whole Vertex core and Vertex ecosystem is implemented using callbacks because we love suffering. Um, that's all. Uh, but you can use Eric, as we have seen. And it's polyglot. So for example, you can use Kotlin. And in Kotlin, you have something very cool, which is named Coroutine. And we are going to provide you Coroutine support in Vertex. You like Scala? We have a Scala binding that is going to use futures and Scala futures, because Scala futures are really great, really well integrated into the language to do that. So depending on the language you are using, we are providing a different asynchronous non-blocking development model. We have Groovy, we have Ruby, and so on. We have even Ceylon, uh, and I think we have eight of them. Uh, go on the web page, it's written. Um, all of this is going to use an event loop system. Again, one, no. This computer has four core. Yeah. So it can do potentially four things at the same time. Why not using my CPU to its right lever? So instead of having one event loop, I will get well, actually, if I have four core, I would get eight because of pipelining. So it's able to do a lot of things at the same time, but it's still a simplified concurrency because when your system, when your code is being touched by one thread, it will always be executed by the same thread. So no synchronized, no volatile, or no all those cine. And Vertex is used today, and this is just production use, for microservices, of course, uh, web application, IoT gateway, um, um, uh, high volume event processing, uh, API gateway a lot, or well, a message bus and so on. So it's really used because it is able to react to the surroundings and, well, and implement your reactive application. So let's have a look. Vertex is going to be to provide you all the building blocks to build a reactive systems, asynchronous end-to-end, -end, event loop, and everything non-blocking. Good. With a message system, uh, message system built in. We have reactive stream integration. 
So if you need back pressure, we pro propose you either the Vertex way or the Rect Extreme way. Y up to you to choose the one you want. And we provide reactive programming with different language and so on. So it's up to you to decide what you want to do. F Vertex is about freedom. You decide how you want to shape your system. We won't tell you how. Which means that you can experiment and fail and iterate. Um, if we take my application here, this application can be developed in Java, which is quite verbose, in around 100 line of, line of code. First thing, my very simple app. So I have my database there. Uh, my database, I can do an insert on it. I will get a single, because inserting inside my database, just it's an asynchronous operation. So I get a single with the inserted product. And then I just write it to my HTTP response. So every time I have a request, I call my database. This is asynchronous, but the, the thread is released, so I can, under I can get all the other requests. And as soon as the insertion has been successful, I just write to my request, to my response. When my user wants a list of my, uh, of, my uh, of my products, I will first use a chunked HTTP response. So chunked HTTP response comes from HTTP 1.1, and you don't have to have the full response in your memory and write everything inside, uh, inside the HTTP response. No. That is stupid, because you are using your memory, and if you have lots of users, then your memory is going to be your limit. Why doing that? Why doing that while we have chunk responses? And when using chunk responses, as soon as I have something from my database, I will write it directly, immediately to my response, making that my memory usage is still very stable. I have something else, boom, I wrote inside my HTTP response, and the browser is able to get that and add it to my table and so on. When I retrieve my data from my database, it's going to be an observable, so with all my product that will come one by one, or by a batch, I don't know, it will depend on your database, and every time you have one, you just write it to the response. So that was the first part. Let's say that you need to call a pricer every time that you get uh, uh, that you uh, yeah, that you get um, um, a product from your database. So for every product you retrieve from the database, you need to call a distributed remote service, this pricer, to get the price, the current price of your product. So here, I do this asynchronous operation, so I have all my rows that are coming one by one, and for each row, after once I have it, I'm doing a flat map to call my web client, which is just an HTTP client in Vertex, and we'll call the pricer. And when this one has been well, completed all this, I will write the response inside my, JSON, uh, inside my HTTP response. So here we see sequential composition with Vertex and uh, reactive extension. You just flat map. Uh, now, remember, your users are picky and want always to have the latest things immediately. So what we can do here is to use the event bus. The event bus is a backbone of all Vertex applications, making all the Vertex components interact using messages. But when we have this, we can say something like, hey, I have a bridge between this event bus and WebSockets. Actually, not WebSocket. We are going to use SOCGS, which is a JavaScript library that will degrade from WebSocket to long pulling using SSC and so on. So even if you are using Internet Explorer 6, you can still use that, and you will have the result. Well, your user will see uh, updates without having to refresh. But if your user are still using Internet Explorer 6, they're probably not as picky as those ones that run the updates. But well, we never know. And to do that, once the SuckJS bridge is instantiated, you just say vertex event bus and uh, publish the address, the address from my virtual address that I've explained, and search the object. That's all. And it will be sent to the event bus. The SuckJS bridge will get that, send it to the WebSocket, and my browser will get it. Let's now try to call two services at the same time. Again, both are asynchronous. So how do I know when both are done? Because I can call one, I can call the second one, but I want to be sure that both are done when I continue my execution. 
You can do that like this. Get price for product, which is a code we have just seen. This return a single. And then I do another action with my auditing system. So I just write something in my auditing system, and I want to continue when both are done. Then I just say single.zip, my two singles, or my set of singles, and then I have a callback that here just returns uh, the product. This callback is only called when all of them, all the singles here, have been completed successfully. So it's very easy, and both calls will be done at the same time. And then I just continue doing the same thing. So, what about reactive streams? Because I didn't show about reactive streams. So let's imagine that I have control on my IoT device, which is completely fake because you have no control at all on IoT devices. But let's imagine that. And this thing is emitting a lot of values, and you need to control it to say, well, I'm not really able to do that. So what we can do, for example, here, uh, this device just a random integer. I have this as a publisher, reactive stream publisher, or flow publisher. It's uh, exactly the same API. They even keep the same class name. Um, I have a subscriber here. The, subscriber, the publisher subscribe to this subscriber. The subscriber get a subscription object and then can request, typically one, meaning that it tells to the source, OK, I'm ready to get one data. Then it gets the data. And then once he has the data, he can just request another data and so on. So we really, really control the speed of this. Again, this is only possible when you can control the source. There is many, many cases where you can't. Typically, you cannot control users. That's bad, but yeah, you can't. We're thinking about it, but yeah. Uh, so what is reactive? Reactive is about building better system and stopping to lie to us and saying, well, the world is asynchronous, and we will need to do with that. So all, every time you see something reactive, you can say, OK, it's going to be asynchronous. So it can be systems. It can be reactive stream. It can be reactive programming. It's all about being asynchronous. Reactive system is a graph, being, well, building better system, better distributed system. And except if you build a game, and even today, even game are distributed system, you are just have distributed system everywhere. So this will help you build responsive distributed system. But it's very, very complicated in terms of API and stuff like that. So we strongly recommend to use a reactive programming approach to do that. This will tame the asynchronous beast, and you have an asynchronous development model you can understand. And if you have flows that you can control, and you want to be sure that you won't crash with an out of memory or something like that, you have right to streams that will handle back pressure. So I'm in London, so I cannot stop or end this presentation without doing a tribute to the Beatles. So all you need is reactive love. Thank you very much. <laughs> Before going further, I will start the app. So that's the app that I just did right now here. So it's um, so we have the pricer here so to call the pricer that I need to start. Let's start the pricer. Come on. Um, I have my router with my reactive REST API here. So that's vertex code. But again, you can write it with any other reactive uh, platform. Um, that's my reactive stream part. So just the code from the uh, uh, from the slide, and here it is. And I have right now 110 line, and it's a very big font. So you can probably reduce it to less than 100 line. And when I run this, here it is. I have. I don't have anything because I forget to stop the first one, and both are listening on the same port. Let's restart. OK. Oop. That's maybe a bit too big. So what we have here is really what we have just seen is we have a database, and I retrieve my products, and the price is running in another service, and I call every time that I have this in uh, uh, every time that I have a product, I call the pricer. 
So now, if I come back here and I do, I want bacon, what we have seen here is the WebSocket. So I pushed bacon to my uh, REST API, it wrote that in my database asynchronously. As soon as it's back, um, it calls the pricer. Once he has a price, it sends this to the WebSocket, to the event bus, which sends it to the WebSocket, because I'm using Chrome, and Chrome has very good support for WebSocket. What we see here is the uh, React stream things. Because I know that it's uh, last day of DevOps UK, I generate a random integer every three seconds and not too fast. So I use React stream to reduce the speed because well, I can generate random number very, very quickly, but I know that you want to read them. So only every two, uh, three seconds or five seconds, I can't remember what I wrote, uh, you have another random integer. So, and why I'm showing you this is because last week we released this book. Here. That's the very last one that you can find in a printed version. Very, very last one. We, we ran out of it. Uh, we did three conferences with that. Uh, so the first one that we call me, uh, that we ask a question, and if the number you see here is below five, you, won, you win the book, the very last one. So if you have questions, we have four minutes, but check the timing. So, do we have any question? If there is no question, I keep it. I wrote it, so I know it, but I never read it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Three! You made it! <laughs> I was just wondering, uh, can you do um, relational operations like joins, you know, between streams and between tables and such like? So, the question is about doing composition of different stream and so on. So yes, if you use reactor, reactive extension one or two, you have operation and uh, to do that, mm -hmm. to combine streams, to wait for the completion of one, to you, you can do almost everything. You have all those operators to do that. Use an API for this that already exists because it's very, very hard to implement it right. Don't try to implement it by yourself, especially with callbacks. That's something, when you look at reactive streams, you say, ah, but it should provide that. Actually, no. Reactive streams is really four classes that just do back pressure. It does not provide any operators to combine the streams or to do filtering or what you want to do on streams. So you really have to do that using reactor, reactive extension one, or reactive extension two, or version one and version two. Another question? I don't, ha I ran out of books, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you can have stickers. <laughs> uh, we have one there. Yeah. So for me, there is two questions. First one, how can we manage acknowledgement? So if we send something and we want to be sure, for example, if I want to send a trade on the market, and I use several services to do that, I, I can be sure the trade is really on the market. So the first one, and the second one, I would like to know how we manage when it fails. So if I send a message and never receive a message back, how can I, how can, can I manage this? Is it timeout? And even if we, we put timeout everywhere, it depends on the size of our machine. Maybe it's going to be five sec, 10 sec, one hour, I don't know. And I, maybe I don't want to manage this. So to answer your first question, uh, you have several ways. First, the messaging that is, will be used by your reactive system can be reliable messaging, and then you will know whether or not it has been dispatched or not. If you use a Vertex event bus, you will uh, add a callback that will tell you that will be the response from the other side. So if it ha has received your trades or your quotes and successfully write it, wrote it inside the system, it will reply to you, and so you can be sure that it has been successful. How about you retry? So first, Generally, retry is a very, very bad idea. Why? Because you have A and you have B. A sends message to B and it gets a timeout, for example. So if you retry, what does that mean? That means that it will re-emit the same message. But what about the failures that happen? Maybe the message between A and B has been lost. 
Okay. Maybe B has crashed. Okay, and the operation has, has failed, so in both cases, you can still retry safely. But maybe B has take your order, apply it to the market, and the message response is lost. And in that case, you probably don't want to retry, or you are going to run out of money. So in that case, you need to have some kind of reliable messaging that would tell you this. There is no bur uh, silver bullet here except developing a system that use it, well, that is idempotent, in the sense that even if you retry something that has already been applied, it doesn't harm your integrity. Uh, sorry, I'm time's up. There is a couple of stickers here. I will stay around for the next hour, probably close to the Red Hat booth, if you have the question. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> don't have the book anymore. You can download it for free from this URL here, and the slide will be. I will tweet the slide in a couple of minutes. Thank you. <laughs>